In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. The ruling on the field stands. We deliver jerseys, funny foam fingers, and everything you need for the game. But what you really get is so much more. FedEx delivery. Game day spirit. What we deliver by delivering. Welcome back to another edition of the Daily Memphian Memphis Tigers podcast. This is your host, Drew Hill. I'm sitting here, as always, with Daily Memphian Memphis football beat writer Jonah Jordan. What's going on? It's been sort of a busy week, huh? Yeah, it's been a little busy. National Signing Day and the Finally, like. some football news. Yeah? A little bit. Not not a ton. Nothing crazy. How many How many guys? I guess we'll start with that so we can knock that out pretty quick. How um, many guys they signed yesterday? I think it was like five. Um, no, they had two commit over the weekend, then a surprise with, uh, Joshua Hastings out of Cordova defensive back who like led the region in interceptions this year. They were able to lock him down. They really wanted to address the defensive side of the football because they, they only had like one or two signings from defense over the, in the early period. And I mean, they need to get better in that area. They need corners. They need corners bad. Um, and then they needed to, they, Obviously, are probably it sounded like they're switching to a three four under McIntyre, and they wanted a big defensive tackle. And Maurice White is that he's six five. He's going to be the biggest defensive lineman on the team. He's massive. And then they had Corey Gainwell, who's going to come in, and um, everybody's going to get to see that. That's going to be fun. I mean, I'm interested to see what he can do as a running back. He's only like five seven, five eight, but man, he's fast. And he put up some stats down in Mississippi, which I, I really don't think people should, you know, scoff at. I mean, they like you know, it's hard. It's hard to do what he did. Is it hard to recruit? Is it harder to recruit defensive players when you're in the AAC, which is known for offense and playmakers? You think? Um, no, I don't. I don't believe that. Do you think it's the same as recruiting offense? Yeah, I think it's the same. Recruiting is recruiting. I think that Memphis has some talent on the defensive side of the football. I'd say they are a very, very talented team. I just think you know it hasn't come together. You know, and sometimes that great offense does put your defense in a position that. That is difficult. Like when Memphis goes out and they score in two plays after the defense just was on the field for 15 minutes, it's difficult. So I, I do think there's a lot of variables on why the AAC has kind of a reputation for being poor defensively. But Memphis improved last year. Talked to Mike McIntyre, though, for um, for a little bit, and he was he's very excited to get going. This team, fin- they finished like what, in the 70s or something? But really their recruiting class was – Getting guys back, correct? Yes, that was the best. That was the best recruiting job you can do. Yeah, they, I mean they got they got Brady White, they got Demonte Coxey, TJ Carter's coming back. I never, I don't really think TJ was ever really in doubt considering he suffered that season-ending injury. But I mean he's coming back. Sean Dykes is coming back to play tight end. John Pop Williams coming back to play receiver. Both of those guys suffered season-ending injuries pretty early into the season, and so I mean. Man, he was, Ryan Silverfield was able to come in and say, "Hey, let's run it back. You know, like we've got something special here. Let's let's go back and do it again." So that was probably the uh, honestly it, overall big picture. They did well. Yeah, right. Yeah. The numbers don't really reflect. really like the what you can go read my story over at thedailymemphian dot com from earlier this week. But this is what I wrote about. Ryan's been recruiting and selling Memphis and selling himself to people for two months. I mean, it's been since ever since the beginning of December, really. Um, I mean, he had to sell himself to administration. He had to sell himself to fans. He had to sell himself. He had to recruit players back. He had to do the early period. He went out and recruited while being an interim coach. He's having to go to people and be like, "Hey, come to Memphis because I think, like, hey, I'm gonna be. I think I'm gonna be the coach, but I don't know. Like, it's. I think it's gonna be cool if I am the coach. And then he gets the job and he has to nail down the early period. Then he's not done. He has to replace basically his entire staff he has to go out he recruits McIntyre they put together a pretty killer defensive staff with Burt Watts who's pretty good Charles Clark Kyle Pope Kyle Pope is going to be a killer like I talked to people um he's going to be coaching defensive line for Memphis he's an up-and-comer in this in this league like or in this profession he coached at Alabama as a defensive analyst as a defensive lineman and I mean how good you can tell me how good is Alabama's defensive line how good has it been for the last whatever years? 
Well, I don't know. This last year is different. Well, he wasn't there last year. <laughs> just so, I'm just but then he went to Obviously, Liberty. They've been good. They put a lot of guys in the NFL. So then he went to Liberty, where he was successful, and then Ryan was able to get Kyle Pope over another Power Five school. Then he pulled a guy from Syracuse. He pulled a guy from USC for his support staff. Like, but the real test for Ryan and his recruiting prowess is begins next year. Right? This when is he's it finally well, got a now. fair shake. Yeah. It begins now. Um, well, it began a few weeks ago, really, when 2021 started heating up. Um, I think they're going to knock it out of the park. I think this staff is going to recruit very well. I think it's going to look a lot like Mike Norvell's second class did, where it's probably going to be one of his higher rated class, or Silverfield's highest rated class. It's going to be way higher rated. It, the thing is, the one thing I think Norvell kind of did a disservice to whoever took over next for him is blue shirts. Blue shirts, I'm going to try and explain this in a in a way that makes sense. Blue shirts are, okay, I'm going to put this guy on scholarship when camp starts, but it's going to count towards my next class. That is why the next class always have small numbers. That's why the last few years it's been dwindling and dwindling and dwindling in the amount of people that they can take because there have been so many blue shirts. And I think that's something Memphis kind of wants to get away from because they want to have a class where they can put together the amount of talent that they need for the future. Blue shirting... I mean, it is. It varies on opinion. It may not be bad. I, I don't know if it's a disservice. That may be, you know, but it does hurt when it comes to class numbers. So all in all, spring football starts pretty soon, correct? Yes. Uh, I think it starts sometime in March. I want to say March 16th or the 18th or something like that. But football is not over. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl, and then the XFL starts this weekend. I don't know. I, I went through the You don't AAF. have a team. I went through the AAF experience. I had to cover that. I really don't know if I want to do the You XFL don't have yet. an XFL team. There's no. I don't do we even know, know the, where they are. Do we know if there's any Memphis players in the XFL? There's one, Latarius Brady. He's playing for the Los Angeles team. Okay. Well, then, if you're a Memphis fan looking for an XFL team, what are they? What, they're the Wildcats? Something like that. I think I'm trying the to think Wildcats. of, I, I don't even know who's in the XFL besides Latarius Brady. Like, I don't. Is there okay. anybody notable? Well, Landry Jones, I think. Bob Stoops is a coach for the Dallas <laughs> Renegades. Landry Jones is their quarterback. Aaron Murray, for, former Georgia okay. quarterback. That's fun. Uh, and Antonio Callaway, who was cut by the Browns, is also yeah, on. He's gonna They're both on people. Tampa Bay. I have so little interest in this after doing the AAF that I can't even explain it to you in words. <laughs> the AAF was the worst thing I've ever had to cover. And I do not want to... Not the worst thing. Like, the experience was fun. The games were fine. Like, the media access was what it was. But watching it crumble and having to talk to those people involved while it crumbled it made me not want to have to, like, get invested in something like that ever again. Okay. Well, I think the XFL has a better chance. And if you're a Memphis fan, there you have it. You can be an L.A. Wildcats I hope that's correct. I'm just guessing. That's L a guess, in LA yeah. Wild. I don't know any of the teams. Fan. All right. Now we'll take a break for a message from our sponsor. The Daily Memphian Tigers podcast is brought to you by FedEx. Possibilities. What we deliver by delivering. And on to basketball in the middle of the season. Uh, Temple is not good. A lot more that's going on. Yeah, let's talk about this. So Memphis beats Temple by what, 15? But hey, they took care of digits. a bad team that they were supposed to. That is that is encouraging. They did that on Wednesday. Malcolm Dandridge had a career high. He dunked Lester on Canones, someone. He did dunk on someone. Lester Canones had a, uh, tied his career high. Uh, Precious had another good game. You got a lot of contributions from a lot of people. Obviously, this comes after DJ Jeffries gets injured and is now out four to six weeks, which is optimistic. I would say. Basically, so you weren't here for Adonis Thomas. Okay. Um, Adonis Thomas came in. I think DJ probably a little bit better than Adonis was at the time, but hurts himself, has surgery. I don't think DJ's having surgery, is he? I think that's to be determined. To be determined, but then at the end of the season, Adonis comes back when Memphis makes the tournament and they kind of rush him out there. He wasn't in shape. He wasn't ready. He was still kind of hurt. He was like limping around. It looked looked like he just wasn't ready. Are we going to see a situation like that with DJ where they kind of like, okay, we made the tournament. Let's see what DJ can do. Or are we no, just not going to see I it I don't again? think so. I think, I mean, the only scenario where I can envision that is if Memphis is already a lock to be in the NCAA tournament. 
and they know getting DJ back is going to help them. Um, because if they end up losing a bunch of games and it looks like they're going to the NIT, there's you know, no. It's, it is obviously a, a sensitive subject because you could still win the conference tournament and get into the NCAA tournament. But if they are, if they look like they're going to the NIT, I just don't see any reason why you would try and rush him back when, you yeah, know, he could be, you know, he's a guy that's a fringe NBA guy where if he comes back, he could may be, be doing awesome for you next year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like the year two DJ Jeffries could take that leap into being a first round pick, a lottery pick. Like maybe he does some things like he turns into a ball dominant. So you forward. don't want to, you don't want to risk that. Yeah. And now it's about finding ways to move forward. I wrote last week in my notebook, I think the two best things that Memphis can do is get more shots for Lester Quinones, which you saw against Temple and it worked out and also allow Lance Thomas to take those minutes. I think that was going to naturally happen anyway. Yeah. Um, just because he's playing so much better. He wouldn't have taken DJ's minutes, but like he was going to get a minutes boost anyway. Um, because he is playing that much better. And I would strongly encourage, uh, if you haven't read the, the feature, I wrote on uh, Lance Thomas and the death of his high school teammate and the writing on his shoes. You should definitely go check that out. But those, those two are the big keys to me and they both are playing really well right now. So I think what you saw in that temple game was very, very, very encouraging. So I I hadn't been down to the form in a while and I came down for the temple game. It had been a minute. Maybe you, maybe you're the one. I am. Good luck charm. But uh, no, I was standing um, in the marketing tunnel, which is, basically just opposite of where on the same side opposite where the tigers run out and it is startling how athletic this team like it it, like they are athletic they suffocate you like it's when you're right there watching it like those temple I, i mean memphis came out a little slow temple hit a few threes shots they probably don't normally make their offense is awful terrible but Sooner after a little bit, it was like, okay, Temple's just not getting any good shots. And when they do, it's cons- what like, we've seen all season. When they get around, the, when they got around the paint, Malcolm Dandridge, Precious Chua, Lance Thomas were contesting it. And I'm Lester can rebound, man. Like, like, but Lester can stick his nose in there, do a little bit. I don't know what his total was, but it seemed every time like he wanted to go get the ball, he got it. Like, I don't know. I was just impressed with their general defense. Maybe it's because I hadn't seen it in person really since, like, what, the beginning of the season. So it was just really impressive to see them do that against a team like Temple, even though I don't think Temple is great. No, Temple is not very good. But here's the thing. And since since this four-game stretch started against UCF following the loss to SMU, it's been so, there are reasons to feel better. Um, even with DJ getting hurt because, and there is also, and I'll add a caveat. There are also reasons to believe that it may not continue to get better, but for the time being, it's getting better. Um, at for against SMU, you have Boogie Ellis come out of his shell and play really well. Then, uh, against UCF, you have Lance Thomas go for his 20 point explosion. You see a little bit of improvement, um, against, against Temple in the turnover department and you find a good way to sort of lock things down and avoid that long scoring drought and find a way to win against UConn. So everything that has really hurt Memphis but between two guys that they thought were going to be good that hadn't been very good, they've figured it out. The turnovers, they haven't figured out yet, but it seems like they have a better plan now um, at, at minimizing those. So there are definitely been positive positive signs and when they went into this four game stretch UCF Temple uh UConn at home and now they'll play South Florida you're going into that thinking all right if we can get four wins in a row here maybe just maybe Memphis feels that much better about themselves and has a little bit of momentum going into this road trip next week because this this trip next week could well, Make I think it starts Saturday. Season. I think it starts Saturday. That South Florida team, which I mean, they're not a pushover, but they're definitely not good. They're not good, but they gave they beat Memphis a few weeks ago. No, now, they, they Memphis came. They back Memphis came back. Oh, game. Memphis came but back. They and led won that Memphis game. for okay. almost the entire game, and they're really good at forcing turnovers. So they're not so that's a great the thing. matchup for yes. Memphis. They're not a good matchup. Like, 
I don't know. It's going to be one of those sleepy three in the afternoon Saturday games. I, I, I wouldn't overlook the South Florida game just to look at that road trip, even though road trip is difficult. You go to UConn, you go to Cincinnati. I, I asked Penny about this after what, the game. What did he say? I asked Penny about that exactly, which is you said coming into this three-game home stretch that you needed three wins. You can't afford to drop any more home games. And looking forward to next week, you got Cincinnati, who just beat Wichita State last night on the road, by the way, and is playing really well and would be a is, is already a massive win at home, but would be a huge win on the road next week. And UConn. Both games that are really big for your tournament resume. How do you avoid looking ahead to those and yeah. make sure you beat South Florida, who's not the easiest matchup for you um, this weekend? And he goes, I don't have to tell my team not to look ahead. They all understand the importance right now of every single game. We've basically just told them every game is a tournament game. I wrote about this yesterday. Every single game is a tournament game at this point because you can't afford to drop any more home games, especially to teams that you are favored against or teams you're supposed to beat. And so now is your opportunity to sort of finish what you started and finish the, these four games against the bottom half of the league because going into these last nine games, it's going to be super difficult. Five games on the road, five games against the top half of the league. Uh, you can't expect to win all nine of them. You, of the you, nine. you might win six of them, and that would be good. Um, yeah. So, or even five of them in some scenarios, and that would be good. So you need you need to beat the teams that you should beat. Well, yeah, they're at that point now where in the season, if you lose to South Florida, what does it do to your what does it do to your net rating? Oh, what does I it mean, do to your bracket? Almost buried if you lose yeah. to South Florida at home. Yeah. Like that's brutal, and then you're going to Cincinnati after being pretty much buried for how many ever days are in between. People are ragging on you, and you've got to go go win at. So you have to win at Cincinnati, and you have to win at UConn. No, you don't have to win at Cincinnati. I don't think, but it's a big opportunity. I mean, you you have to but win if you lose to South Florida. I think you have to go. Win oh at yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Like that puts you in a even more precarious position than you're already in. Like it'll put you in a win now situation for what two straight weeks, three straight weeks, pretty much the rest of the way. So you got to take care of South Florida. You have to take care of East Carolina so you don't end up getting getting buried. Like, it, it'll be bad, like, if you lose those games. Right. That I mean, that's just the absolute killer on your NCAA tournament resume. Um, but the way I see it, you've got a trip to Houston, a trip to SMU, a trip to Cincinnati, um, and then you got a home game against Wichita State. Of all those games, you're not go like it's unrealistic it's, to think you're going to win every single. It's one. very difficult to think you're going to to win more than you lose, or at least go even in that stretch. Is probably good enough <laughs> to get yeah. in the NCAA tournament. So it's right now. It is less about piling wins, and it's more about avoiding the bad losses for Memphis. And uh, and this let, let's just be clear: losing at home to South Florida would one hundred percent be a bad loss. Yeah. So, but again, reasons to be positive. Yeah, no, for sure, reasons to be positive. Boogie's looking better. Precious is playing well. Malcolm's playing. Everybody seems to be hitting at the right time. Lester's coming into his own. Like he he hit some really really tough shots, really big shots for that team. Uh, but one thing I wanted to talk to you about was the Jonathan Gavoni from Draft Express tweeted about James Wiseman yesterday. I'm interested in your take on this, where James Wiseman is, what he's up to. I know people are probably like, oh, James Wiseman talk. Like, I don't want to talk about any of the quitting or this, that, and the other, but where? what's he up to? What's well, going on with James? Jo I mean, he's training in Miami, but what what, um, what Jonathan Gavoni said was basically that because of the teams that have tr that traded um, and traded made – yeah, yeah, and traded and made moves, they're not – really going to need a big man anymore. The teams at the bottom and the one team in particular that you look at is Golden State yep. because they may end up with the first pick who now, um, the way he views it, could be drafting another guard because they get rid of D'Angelo Russell. So, um, in general, it's just that's, that's not good for James. But, like, here's the reality. When James left Memphis – I don't think there was any expectation that he was then going to be the number one pick. If James wanted to be the number one pick, he should have stayed at Memphis. He should have played. And he should have played. Yeah. But, uh, you, know, you know, that's just sort of how 
that's what you have to weigh when you make a decision like that. And that's why I think some of the people that James talked to when making this decision probably told him, go back hey, to school. Yeah, to I don't play. think it all yeah. was one-sided. Because if James's goal was to be the number one pick, then he did not make the smart decision for his future. Yeah. Now, if the goal was to avoid getting injured and get your money and train – Stop going to school. Just go Stop, chill. Miami, yeah, yeah. Do make do, TikToks and Snapchats. <laughs> then mission accomplished. But uh, I think that the idea that he was going to get picked number one. I mean, he's. I, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying he. I mean, there's severely a really damaged his chances to do of doing that when he left. There's Memphis. a universe or a timeline where he goes out and kills it at the combine. His measurables are off the chart. He plays five on five and he kills it and he's awesome and he impresses everybody and they're like, oh man, this kid is the next coming of Tim Duncan or David Robinson or whatever. And he goes number one no matter what because he is that right. talent. That's not off the table. That's sure. not off the table, but I think he did do himself a disservice. Somebody who is playing well though is Precious Achua. Some people have him in the lottery. Some people, where's where's Precious's draft stock right now? He's, think? I think he's been about what people thought he was going to be coming yeah. into the year, right? Like a fringe He's lottery here. selection. And for those of you who think that maybe there's a chance he comes back, I'm just going oh, to no, he's to, going I'm go on the record right now and say no chance. Um, he'll be in the NBA draft. If so, Precious goes to the if, if Precious stays for a year, no, it's not. Like, no, let's we're no, not I'm even, not even, we're say, not even like, posing that because it's not happening. No, it's not happening. Like, uh, especially with his age, like he needs to. He needs to go. He needs to go now. So, um, but fringe lottery, fringe lottery guy. I think he's been. I mean, as a player, he's been better. I think than people sort of expected. Yeah, partly because they lost James, and now he can do more. He can fill the stat sheet think, more. But as a prospect, I think he's about where he, where everybody thought yeah. he was when the season. I think started. the makeup of the team and the problems that they're having with turnovers and spacing have kind of done him a disservice at times. So where precious couldn't show off all he can do, you know, well, like they can't get the ball to him sometimes, or they turn the the decision to play him at the five was a decision that made sense for the team. No, no, no. Like that's probably the right move. Right. But I, what I'm saying is, what, I, what I'm getting to is that when the when they decided to play him at the five, there's now been struggles from the guards getting him the ball yeah. as a five. Whereas if he wasn't playing a five, it might be easier to get him the ball. But he's in the right spot. Yeah. I mean, there if you're Memphis, like you, this is part of playing for a college team is understanding that there has to be some sort of sacrifices on either side. I know it's Precious's goal to make it to the NBA, right? And maybe his best interest in making it to the NBA and being selected higher is playing a different position, but he also has to think about the best interests of the school and his teammates and his coaches. And I think he's done an excellent job of that and of, you know, sort of accepting his role and sacrificing for the good of the group. And I think that's part of the reason why he's such a respected guy on Memphis's team. Yep. Not just that he's the best player, that he's a team guy first. I still think if Boogie Ellis, if they make the tournament, Boogie Ellis comes out and looks like puts on a show. I still think there's a way he works himself up there. Like a guard like that, if he came out there and looked like Kimba Walker, like does that kind of performance and carries Memphis to two, three. I wins. don't know. It's a little late. It may be. Is is it too late? Do you think it so? It Feels a little late. I want to believe. I want to believe Boogie has it in him just because I like those kinds of guards, but I think that'll do it for today. That'll do it for today. Uh, Thanks for joining me. As always, Jonah, you're the best. You can get this podcast or any other Daily Memphian podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. You can follow me on Twitter at Drew Hill underscore DM. You can follow Jonah on Twitter at underscore Uh, underscore underscore Jonah Jonah Jordan. Jordan. We only do this every week. Yeah, and thanks for listening. We deliver tickets, team merchandise, and everything you need for the game. But what you really get is so much more. FedEx delivery. Game day spirit. What we deliver by delivering. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, the Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.